Okay, so thank you very much for coming to the session where we're going to speak about Spring Boot. Probably most of you already know Spring Boot. Also, we're going to speak a bit of Kafka. Yeah, maybe half of you knows Kafka. And finally, the Visium. And I assume that, yeah, maybe the division is the less well known here. My name is Alex Soto. My tutor is Alex Soto B. If you want to stay updated with uh, Java News or Kubernetes um, ecosystem platforms like Tecton, Canary, Argo City, and so on, you can follow me on Twitter. Also, you've got my email. If you've got any question, just send me that on email. That's fine. For this reason, I have got the email here. And well, yeah, I'm author of uh, some of books. So today, we're going to see a bit of understanding Kafka, just two or three slides about Kafka, what is change data capture, change data capture patterns, and finally, Spring Boot and Kubernetes. Because, well, maybe some of you are already developing microservices architecture, or I like to call services architecture, and maybe you've got something like this. You've got the order service that stores some data inside a database, and then after that, it just sends a request to other services. These services can be like here, a shipment service or a customer service, but also it could be, for example, an, a cache. You want to have your cache updated or an index database, like for example, Elasticsearch. So you're just doing two things most of the time, just write to your database and then after the write, you need to write this data to another place. And you can get it, these dual writes are prone to inconsistencies because what's happened if the first write uh, works, but not the second one? When you're trying to reach the Elasticsearch for updating the indexes, you get it an error that the Elasticsearch is not there anymore. What you can do? Okay, you could say, yes, I know. We're going to implement some pollings. So basically, if there is an error, no worries, I'm going to just put this in a job or in a cron job and periodically we'll try to update this index. And of course, if you do it in this way, first of all, you get some inconsistencies. Also, you need to stay all the time checking what are the jobs there, if they are behaving correctly or not. So this is what we want to fix. This is what I want you to learn today after the session, how to fix this problem. First of all, Kafka. Um, why? Kafka, it's named Kafka, basically it's because of Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka was an, uh, was an author that he really loved writing a lot, not just books. He wrote a lot of letters, especially for, the, for his dad and his mom. And Apache Kafka, it's a system that was optimized for writing. You, if you are already working with Kafka, you know that Kafka just works pretty well when you want to write data to disk. And for the reason they name it Kafka. So basically, what is Apache Kafka? Okay, it's just a public subscribe system like the old JMS uh, systems, RabbitMQ and so on. Nothing new in this sense. But one of the great things about Kafka is that it's full tolerance and scalability by construction. When they built Kafka, they had in mind all the time being full tolerance, which is super important nowadays with the microservices architecture, and also scalability. It's really easy to build Kafka clusters and just make it scalable. And, and that's a big difference between Kafka and the rest of the messaging systems is processing the streams in real time. With Kafka, you do not need to process all your data, all your events in a batch process you can just do it in real time in a really easy way. And in Kafka, the main, let's say, the main um, unit of work as a developer is a topic. Okay, we've got a topic. The topic is where we place all the events. In fact, and here we can start talking a lot about, um, about uh, the topic, is that it's composed by partitions and the producers just produce events to the topic and the consumers just consume events from the topic. I know that that's not entirely true, but I don't want to extend on that. And one of the great things about Kafka is that the events that you send, it can be of any type. It can be just a string, it can be a JSON, it can be a binary file, it can be a YAML. I don't know if anyone here loves to count white spaces, 
But if you like, then you can also put here a YAML. In fact, I really like to always think about the YAML files, right? Because it's a typical example of simple problem resolved in a complex way, right? This is the YAML. Another example is JavaScript. It's exactly the same thing. It's simple problem resolved in a complex way. So what is just change data capture? Well, basically, change data capture is just capture DB changes when you insert some entry inside the database, when you update a table, when you update an entry, when you delete an entry, just take this change and send, the, send it all, send them all these changes as an even. And in this example, okay, we are putting here a Kafka topic. It could be any stream uh, system, but in this case, it's a Kafka topic. What is the big advantage of this approach? Is that you got your DB, you insert something, and this insertion creates an event to a stream processing pipeline, for example, Kafka. And then on the other side, you can just connect to that stream and react to these changes. For example, if you've got another database, maybe for pre-production, you could just, this DB could be your production database, you insert something and you can keep updated your pre-production database automatically. Or maybe you want to communicate to other services that there has been a new insert. Could be a Go, Quarkus, Spring Boot, whatever, any other service can be listening this topic and just react. It could be serverless using Knative. It could be, for example, Elasticsearch, as I said, when you insert something to the database and you want this entry be searchable or indexable, you can just connect their Elasticsearch. Maybe Kafka Streams, if you want to process all these events uh, on real time, or even you can invalidate or update the cache, the, your, your caches. If you got your cache and you insert something new in the database, you might want to update your cache. You can just do a dual write, as I explained in, in the beginning, which is somehow a bad practice, or you can just connect your cache to the Kafka topic and automatically will be updated. So what is, at the end, Divisium? OK, Divisium is a Kafka connect. That is the missing part between connecting a database and connecting an Apache Kafka cluster. So you've got your Apache Kafka cluster with all these topics. You've got your database, could be a MySQL, could be a PostgreSQL database, and you want that every time that you insert something inside this database, this entry is populated to a topic. And this is Divisium. Divisium is just listening for a change in the database and populate that change to Apache Kafka. And then on the other side, since you are inside Kafka, you can just use Kafka Connect to populate this change to Elasticsearch, InfiniSpan, uh, Datagora House, wherever. And how, Kafka, um, how Division works is not just doing queries to the database, because this will be inefficient. And also, OK, you are just adding more and more uh, workload on your database. And it's done just um, reading the database transaction log. You know that at a, a database, every time that something happens, it just creates a log file where everything is there stored. Basically, this is done for recovery purposes. Suppose that in the middle of a transaction, the database goes down, and then when you boot up the database again, you need to find a way to recover, and it uses this transaction log. And this is exactly what Division does. It just reads this change in the transaction log, and detects if it's an insert, an update, and a delete, and then it sends the event. And again, this is um, created as a Kafka Connect, and it populates to Kafka. And Divisium um, supports also, for example, a snap shooting, filtering, and so on. So you can just filter which events you want to react. You can also, for example, not starting from zero. So you can have your database there. And then when you start Division, it just reads all the entries, and then it populates them, sending an event. So it's not just reacting on time. You can just have your application up and running without Divisium, you install Divisium, and then automatically starts um, populating all these events. It has support for outbox uh, patterns, we'll see in the demo. It has also a web-based UI, which, okay, yeah. Uh, sometimes um, it's not necessary to use the UI at all, but if you find 
more comfortable with UIs, then you've got one. It's open source, it's super active, and it's used in large production deployments. Well, this is some of the um, mm, companies out there that is using Division, like Ubisoft or Zalando, Reddit, and so on. So it's, let's say that it's bulletproof in production. Maybe you ask, okay, we've got Division, but which databases are supported in Division? And these are the ones. It's MySQL, Postgre, MongoDB, SQL Server, DB2, and Oracle. So probably from the SQL space, most of you are covered. And from NoSQL, uh, well, I don't know if it has exactly which, if it's SQL or NoSQL. That's not true. But you've got Cassandra and MongoDB. So if you are using any of these um, databases, you can use uh, Divisium. Of course, um, there are also some uh, um, people that are doing their own connectors. In the documentation, you can find how to create your connector for uh, connect division with, let's say, in another engine. But this is the ones that, let's say, officially uh, support it. Then, um, how uh, uh, looks like a data change even? Because at the very end, what we want to do is populate an event. And in division, you can modify how an event looks like. But this is the default. Um, the default um, structure. Uh, in this case, I put it as a JSON file, but it could be any other um, format. First of all, it shows you the beef. Uh, this is, of course, in the case of an, of an update. It, it says what was the before event and what was the after event. So you've got before the entry was uh, this, uh, any Kretschmer, and then it was the last name was Ren. So it just says the before and the after, of course. If it's an insert, then there is no before, there is only after, and if it's a delete, uh, then there is only before and not after, okay? But that's a thing of, of implementation. And also, it, um, it saves some uh, metadata about the table, the transaction ID, and uh, the operation type, and the timestamp. So you'll see here that this says that this before and after of course, well, it says that in which connector was, was the PostgreSQL, the DB, the schema, the table, the transaction ID, and finally, if you see here, there is an AU which says that this is an update. So sometimes if you don't know exactly if this has been an update or an insert or what, yeah, you can just relay on this up, um, this up field. Now, which change data capture patterns we can implement? Well, there is a lot. We have seen that you can use for auditing, you can use for updating uh, uh, an elastic search to communicate to other services. But here I'm going to focus on two patterns that I would say that most of the people uh, usually use Divisium. The first one is the outbox pattern. I don't know if you know what is outbox pattern, but basically uh, it tries to fix the problem that I originally presented during the presentation, which was service needs to update their database. That's, that's a fact. We've got a, an order service, and when we make a new order, we need to insert this order inside the database. But also, most of the time, we need to send messages to other services. Elasticsearch, another service, and, and uh, a cache, like InfiniSpan or Redis, and so on. And what's important is that we need to do consistently. We want to be sure that when things happen, it happens. And if not, that is a rollback in a global. Because if you see, there is no concept in microservices of global transaction. You just have a transaction on our place, but not globally. And Outbox pattern tries to fix this problem. And it works in this way. We've got the order service the database, and maybe the database has two tables, the order or the order line. These are the business tables. So it's just the tables that, or the entities that we usually uh, implement because of our business. But then we create another table in the database that it's named Outbox. You can name it whatever you want, but it's, you know, it's nice to have Outbox in the name so you exactly know why this table is here. And we've got the outbox table. This outbox table looks like this. Uh, it has an ID, the, um, the aggregate type, so you can just put the uh, type of the information you're going to store, the aggregated ID, the event type. Why you wanted to send this event? Maybe because the order was created, 
or maybe it was because the order line changed. So you, for example, you uh, you uh, um, you uh, first of all you ordered, uh, let's say, two PlayStations Five. Oh, yeah, I know that. I'm saying something pretty unusual, and you want three. So yeah, it could be this order line change. It, okay, so you just put the type, and finally the payload. And the payload is what you want to communicate to the other, for example, the shipment service or the customer service. And again, it could be anything. It could be a JSON, it could be a string, whatever you want. Then Divisium will be all the time listening, the transaction log, and when a transaction is committed, will read the transaction, so we, division knows that it, that the uh, outbox, uh, the outbox table is uh, stable because the transaction has been committed, and will send the content of the outbox um, entry to the Apache Kafka topic. And as you can see here, you can also route events. So depending on the event type, you can route the entries to one topic or to another topic and of course you can have other services there listening to topics and reacting to that changes also since we are in the apache kafka you could use apache fling for stream processing in real time all these events so it's not just about communicating events from one service to another service but also you can in the middle just process these entries in real time Another pattern is the strangler fig pattern. I don't know if there is any question. No, no, okay. Then let's go to the strangler fig pattern. This is another pattern of, um, let's say that comes because of microservices and it uses for this purpose, to gradually evolve from an all version, let's say, or all monolith application into a microservices um, architecture. Because I'm sure that most of you, someday you face the problem of, okay, we've got the monolith and someone decided that it would be a, a good idea to break down this monolith and just create a microservices architecture. And yeah, that's fine. But how we can do that? Okay, we can do a big bang, so just break down all the architecture, and then you just change it from one to another, which is quite risky. Or we can just use a strangler fig pattern that allows us to temporarily coexist both of the versions. So this is what we want to have. We've got a monolith application with the owner component, the pets component, the visits uh, component, the bets component. We've got, for example, a MySQL database. The web page reads and writes from this monolith, it's implemented in Spring, and what we want is to change that and have our monolith, that now it's less monolith, because we've got the pets component, the, visi the visits component, and the pets component all together, but we break down the owner's component to an owner's service. And now the owner's service is an entity in their own, it's a service, and instead of using the MySQL, yeah, it wants to use MongoDB, for example. So we want to get this. How we can migrate to this scenario? We can do it at once, or we can use a strangler fig pattern. Then, I've got the monolith with all the components. The first thing that you, uh, that you need to do is this complex thing. is First of all, use a proxy. Because if you want to have both of the versions coexisting, you need to have, you know, uh, both so both services running and you need to be able to redirect traffic from one to another. So you put a proxy in front. Then you take out the owner's component, you create the owner's service, and first of all, at the beginning, all the reads and all the writes go to the monolith. But of course, you still have the owner's service with the MongoDB. So every time that you insert something related to the owners, you want to populate this change to the MongoDB. So what you can do is just create or put here Divisium connected to this MySQL instance. You use Kafka, then you use the MongoDB sync connector. And automatically, every time that you write something to this monolith, 
it will write to the database, and this new change will be populated to the MongoDB. And then when you've got this, you can start making reads from the new owner service. So instead of just reading from the monolith, you start reading from the owner service, but the writes always go to the component. So you see that step by step, you're moving from one to another. Of course, you will spend more time there waiting, okay, yeah, it works, there is no regressions, the user experience is, is good, and then it comes this time. When the owner, so you start writing and reading from the owner service. So now every time that I write something, I write a new or uh, a new owner, this write goes to the owner service and it's writing to MongoDB. And then now we've got another problem. And it's like that here we have a MySQL database with the pets, with the visits and the beds. And maybe we've got some foreign keys that are related to the owner service. So now what you need to do? You need to use Divisium to do the other way around. So every time that you write something in the MongoDB database, you need to update this database with the data that you inserted there. So this is another use case of Divisium. So you can keep both of the versions running all the time, and you are just synchronizing the data. Of course, the last step will be do the same with pets component, with visits component, with vets component, and then finally you will do not need Divisium anymore, probably. But that's an interesting use case when you want to migrate your monolith application to a microservices application. There's any question? Yeah? Uh, sorry, so once again, um, is it possible also to use Debezium for, for the data which is already written to MySQL, for instance? So f not only for the updates which are happening, but also for the historical data which is out, th out there. So, you know, the initial bootstrap. Yeah, yeah, it works also for you. So you, you can say, I open Debezium and, and, <coughs> and then just, let's say, loop through all the pre previous entries, just start doing like it was a new insert and then, yeah, and then continue. Yeah, 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 this, uh, this thing works as well. Yeah, keep in mind that um, when, we, uh, when I sh uh, show you before that the opbooks table, at the end it's just a table. With the Visium you can say, I want to uh, um, check for any change of this specific table or all the tables and so on. So it's, n at the end it depends a lot of how you want to isolate your data. Okay, if you want, you can just react to changes on the uh, order table, or you can create an order outbox table and react to these changes, depending on how you want to isolate it. And here it's exactly the same. You can just use directly, in this case, we owner, yeah, it's owners. Yeah, owner table, or you can create an owner outbox table and just do all the interactions between there. It depends on how much you want to isolate, let's say, division from the, the service. My guide works. No. Then, now let's see how we can integrate Spring Boot Kubernetes because, yeah, let's say that Kubernetes is nowadays the de facto platform for deploying microservices. So how all this Divisium and uh, Kafka integrates with Spring Boot and Kubernetes. And I'm going to start with Kafka. How you can deploy a Kafka cluster on Kubernetes. Yes, uh, it might be difficult. I've done this in the past without Streamzy, because Streamzy is just an operator. So you install a Streamzy, and then it's really easy to build your Kafka cluster inside Kubernetes. Because thanks of this operator, your Kafka cluster will be secure by default. It uses well. Uh, it uses out of box security with, yeah, with, I think that it's um, t uh, TLS with the uh, um, client ID and client um, password, but it supports most of the, of, the, um, of the algorithm that are out there for authentication against uh, Kubernetes. It's automatic certificate management, which is really nice because thanks of 
streams you can just update all the certifications management of the of the cluster really easily uh, it's super configurable and it's kubernetes native and that's one of the great things about streamsy that all the time it's just a json or yaml file so you can just do kubectl get kafka and it says you you've got all these kafka clusters or you can do kubectl apply kafka.yaml and you get a, a kafka cluster running on the on the um, on your Kubernetes cluster. And thanks of this, you are able to manage Kafka using GitOps because at the end, all your Kafka cluster, it's a YAML file. <laughs> and then you can just put these YAML files into Git and thanks of GitOps, you can maintain, you can create topics using um, GitOps. And this is more or less how um, deployment file in Kafka looks like. It's like, you said, you see here, I don't know if it works here. Yeah, you, you see he, okay, here, there is the Kafka. So it says that it's of kind Kafka. And then you say, which version of Kafka you want to use? Okay, 2.4. Uh, uh, how many replicas you want? Three. Uh, you, so it means that you want three replicas. Uh, storage, well, you can say it ephemeral, or you can put here the volumes, and so on. The zookeeper, how many replicas you want? Three. Perfect. And then it, at the bottom, you see that it says topic operator. Here, you can just set which topics you want to create. So you just have all these YAML files configured. Then you do kubectl apply, and you will have your Kafka cluster running following this configuration in your Kubernetes cluster. So since the, let's say that the main thing that you need for Divisium is Kafka, you know how to deploy Kafka in Kubernetes. Then we want to run this in Kubernetes, that's fine. But what example I'm going to show you today is that I've got an order service implemented in a Spring Boot using PostgreSQL. And then I want to make an insert of an order. Then this order I will have here Divisium installed. It will take this order. It will send the order to the topic. And then there will be another service in a Spring Boot called Shimman service that it will be listening this topic and getting the event or the entity that was inserted in the database. So well, basically, you can go to the spring and uh, start at the spring.io. You select the in one service, so in the order service, you only, in this case, I only set the uh, spring JPA uh, extension. And for the shipment service, I only set the Kafka, ex uh, Kafka extension or dependency. That's all the things that I need. Now, what I'm going to create is a notebook table. Remember that when I just explained the notebook um, pattern, I said that usually you've got the orders table, then you've got the orders line table, and you create the notebook table where you set there all the data that you want to transmit through Kafka. And in this case, um, well, it's just a JPA entity with, with name Outbox, could be, uh, well, in fact, the name is Outbox even. And you set an ID, you set, for example, the, the aggregate type, the aggregate ID, and then I've got here the string type and the string payload. These are generic fields. You can put any type that you want. In this case, I just put it in a string that will be translated to a JSON uh, object. And also the timestamp. And also I created a notebook repository because I'm using Spring JPA. So I just don't want to spend time on dealing with entity manager and so on. I just set this interface with repository. See that it's, the, it's a cloud repository with notebook. Nothing that probably most of you already use. And then it's time to make this change properly. See that I put it a transactional method. It means that if something happens in any of these states, all will be rolled back. And when I say all, I mean the business entity. You see here I'm doing purchase order repository dot save. Here is I'm saving the order into the order table. Then I just create an order created event that I save to the opbox repository. So I'm saving this event into the table. And here I'm just creating an invoice created event. So it's also the invoice. So I'm just creating two entries into my opbox table for every insert. And I just store it in, as in the opbox repository. 
And finally, I'll return the order. So you can see here that now everything is transactional. If there is an error when I'm trying to save something to the opbox table, it, there will be a rollback. And I, I will not end up in an inconsistent state. Or everything, if the opbox table and the order table are updated at once or not. But it's impossible to have something in the um, order repository or the order table and not in the opbox table. Then we want to start division. And division can run in embed mode. It's, it's a Java project, so it means that you can just take your Java service and start their division, or you can start as a separate process. In this case, I usually run it in a separate process, but you can also run it in embed mode. And in this case, is a Docker Compose example where you set the image with the streams you connect. You, s you set where is the Kafka, because at the end, you've got the division that is inspecting the transaction log, and we want to take these changes and send it to the Kafka. So we need to set where is Kafka. And then here, there is a lot of uh, configuration uh, parameters. You see here there is the converter. In this case, I'm just saying that the keys and the values are in JSON format. Well, then there is a replication, because you can even replicate this um, division, because it's a Kafka Connect um, project. And here, some of the also some of the um, uh, some of the uh, of the parameters lets you, for example, route messages from one place to another. And finally, this tool is if you are using uh, Open Tracing for trace all your calls. And maybe you said, oh, but in the event systems, it's super hard to follow exactly the flow of all your calls. You can just add, use this. Um, uh, tracing consumer interceptor, tracing producer interceptor, and automatically you will see in your, um, in your, for example, Jigger viewer, all the communication between all the services, even if they are um, connected using Kafka. Then we need to configure the vision. So this is just to start and to configure. Well, again, there is a lot of parameters there. One of the important one is the uh, the database configuration, you say, where is the database that I want to react? Then you say, okay, the username, the password, the DB name, we need to give a, a, a server name. And you see here, you see here, there is an inventory old box event. This is the include list. So this is the uh, tables that I want that division reacts. So here I could put inventory dot box event. But it could be inventory dot um, order table, and then I will react to the orders directly. So here you just set in which specific table you want to uh, react. And finally, okay, there is even more. Well, there is all these transforms. You see here there is transforms because if you want, you can even, as I said before, route the um, the events to one topic or another topic depending on some fields. You can even implement your own strategy. You can say, I know that there will be a field inside the payload that its name, I don't know, uh, mm, country. And then depending on the country, I want to move to one topic or another. So you can even implement your own ways to route messages. And then there is the service that is going to be listening the changes. And this is just a Spring Boot application just connected directly to Kafka. You use the Kafka listener. So I want to listen all the uh, events from a Kafka topic. In this case, it was named, uh, wait, because I don't remember. It's, what is the, okay, we'll see. Because now I don't remember, ah, doesn't matter. And then I just seize out everything. So let me show this in action. Uh, I've got here my example. That it's running. That it's running in uh, Docker Compose. I've just configured the Visium. By the way, let me just skip one because, if in case you didn't notice, the example is here. Okay, so if you want to uh, use the or you want to reproduce this demo, it's here in GitHub.com/slash/lord-of-the-shadows/slash/divisium-outbooks. And here you find this example. 
with the Docker Compose file, so you can run it. And now, yeah, now we can start. So I've got here the order. I've got the shipment services. In fact, if I do Docker PS, well, there is a lot of things, but you see that there is the Zookeeper, there is the Kafka, uh, there is the Postgre, there is um, this is uh, Divisium, and then I put it here some UIs so we can see what's happening inside Kafka. And finally, here is the order service and the shipment service. So this is the business logic. Now, what I want to do is um, insert a new order. To insert a new order, mm -mm. let me just go here. So it's easier that I copy it rather than typing. So I'm just set, uh, sending a, you know, an, a post to these orders with a JSON. This is the order. And it says that, okay, you order it. You see here the, the return. It says that there is a customer one, two, three. You enter a division in action, division in for dummies, one, and well, in this case, two. Well, you know, you order it everything. But now, if you see here, you see in the log, there is the processing log line of the shipment service. So I just send something to the order service the shipment service react to this. Well, actually, um, uh, this shipment service are listening to the Kafka topic that was uh, produced by Divisium and just print the JSON file. Now, if you want to uh, see that how internally all these things works, let me uh, do wait because I never remember all the names of the Docker PS Docker exec. Let me go to the Postgre. Bash, bash. Now I'm going to log. Okay, now I'm inside the order DB. And let me select the purchase order. This is my entity. You see the customer ID with the order date. Then I've got here the order lines mm. no inventory no because it's in ben in. wait mm. what's the name of the table okay well it doesn't matter because this is not the important thing. What I want to show you is this, the Obbox event. So every time that I inserted something inside uh, the order table, I also created this Obbox event. You see that it has the ID, the aggregate ID is order, the type, you see all this JSON file, and I created two one. You see that the aggregate type is one for order and another one for customer. So I just created two different kind of events. and now, if I go to wait here to the Kafka UI, this is the, cl the cluster. You see there are two topics, one for the customer, another for the events. So I'm just writing the uh, events that was, were created as a um, as, um, customer goes to the customer topic. The ones that goes to the orders goes to the order topic. Inside here in the orders, of course, you see that there is this event that says that, okay, this is the partition zero with a timestamp, the key, and the content is the content that I created. I think that if I push it here, well, doesn't matter, but this is one of the content that it's populated automatically inside the orders event. As I said before, I'm not producing content directly from my order service to the Kafka topic. I'm just inserting inside my database and then automatically the division will take it and put it inside um, the Kafka. And if I'm going to the other one, I think that was customer. No, cost see, yeah, there is the other one. So you see that there is other information. And um, yeah, I have like um, 10 minutes for questions. I don't know if there is questions or not. No.
Hello. So, uh, I see that you you have the configuration uh, for the Bezion. Uh, you have you say what is the the schema and the database name on the configuration on yeah. the table name. Uh, so. Uh, Imagine we are working with uh, a microservice that has that is multi-tenant, and um, we are adding tenants uh, in runtime. So, is there a way to configure that way? Because we are changing the we are changing yeah. schemas. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, I I, I I didn't show you that thing, but to come. Uh, um, there are several ways of configuring division. One is, as I said before, if, I, if you go here, you see this, this the Outbox, the Outbox connector, you can create the connector here and say, hey, okay, I'm connecting to a MongoDB, and then you set, uh, this. you see here, the filter definitions, and well, it just helps you on creating this. But also, you can use, um, uh, it has a REST API. So you can just uh, um, configure the division using the edge, or using the REST API. In fact, in this case, that I run it, uh, if, I don't know if it's here, yeah. If I'm going to source, I mean, this is how you configure. You see that this is a JSON file, I just create this JSON file, and then I run it, HTTP put to the uh, connectors slash opbox connector config, this JSON file. So you can dynamically uh, configure the division. Which, at the same time, it's risky <laughs> because it means that you've got something stable at 10, it's not stable anymore, and how you draw back. But the good thing is that if you do it in this way, just having JSONs, just at the end, it's just something that probably you've put it in Git, and then you can always do a revert and, and apply it again. But yeah, you have this risk, but yeah, you can do it. Hi. Uh, do you have some tips to work with the vision? Um, because uh, some things are really hard to configure, like the um, topic naming convention. You know, it's it's uh, the name has to be the same as the database name. How to change it, or, or some other tips? Well, yeah, you you can change it. You can change it, uh, but uh, let's say. In my case, I usually like to have things as much common as possible. I mean that if if the table is named, um, you know, having the same names and, and just rel relying to the default. But yeah, it, uh, I don't know if, if I answered your question, but you can change the name of the topics and the tables and so on, yeah. Okay. And about the schema, yeah? if you want to to use some schema in, in Kafka, you know, is it possible? To schema? in Kafka, in the schema registry. Yeah, 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 yeah you, you, you can also, th th in fact, there is, an, um, there is a post, if you find uh, Divisium um, schema registry, there is a post in the, in the Red Hat website that explains you how to connect. Yeah, yeah, th there is no problem, yeah. Okay. I have a question. Okay, thank you. <coughs> How does Divisium know uh, and get access to transaction log? Because it's like quite private thing. Yeah. How does it know? Ah, because uh, it's how, reading the how, how does it get access to transaction logs of the database? Because the database can run on different hosts, on different... Yeah, hosts like here. Like here it's running, well, it's the same host, but it's different containers. So you can think that it's kind of different host because it, it connects using the, uh, if, I, if I'm not uh, wrong, because they, they are changing to make it um, react and so on, they're using the GDBC driver. Uh -huh. okay. yeah, but but, uh, but I, said, I know that they are also changing because now you can configure to uh, work in, in, in reactive drivers as well. So I didn't know exactly by default if they're using the GDBC driver or the, you know, these new react uh, drivers that are not uh, from the platform, right? Okay, thanks. Uh, hello. I have two questions, but I think that the second one is based on the first one. Uh, my first question is that if I want to insert the data directly, means that via my uh, query browser, then what will happen? Means that I'm going to s insert one data into one table, and immediately, for example, I don't know that the Debezium in a sense, uh, 
uh, or publishes the data on the Kafka and another business, another application consumes that. Is it possible or not? Yes, this is, yeah, that's the idea of, of It means that insert a, a, SQL, a SQL command very easy without any, because already that the things that you did, you sent data via, uh, via your application. I want yeah. Yeah, but you, you can just do an insert directly to the database. And it, 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 I mean, that, yeah, this was just to make it more, let's say, user friendly. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you, I, I can just do, well, yeah, I can even do it. But it's like, go to the container, open PSQL, do an insert to the op box table, mm -hmm. and then automatically the division will check the change and Sounds populate right. it to Kafka, yeah. And the second question that I want to know, uh, uh, especially I'm talking about the relational database, assume that already that my use case is very easy. I have a, a father and son, and for the insert, that is it possible that, for example, Debezium uh, publishes the son data sooner than father? In when, me, there is a foreign key. when there is a foreign key, okay, yeah, that already okay. That, yeah, uh, pop, um, it means that my application already is listening to the Kafka, suddenly it gets the data from the from the son, and there is a one definitely one foreign oh. key, but still, that uh, for example, that the father is not available. Then what? Yeah, will happen? well, uh, keep in mind that if you use the odd box pattern, you are creating the 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 odd box table, so you can just put there whatever you want. But this is an extra insert. I don't want to have that table. You don't want to have a table. Yeah, I, I already I have a thousand, uh, for example, a hundred tables, and for each table I would like to have one Kafka, uh, one Even. Kafka event. Yeah. yeah. Why should I have uh, uh, another table, for example, as an output pattern? Well, yeah, as I said, uh, depending on if you how when you want to isolate uh -huh. the your data from the division, but yeah, you you could do it. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, you, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Then what will happen when already I have the sun? Still, but there is no. Yeah, but uh, uh, at the end, what what uh, division is going to do is just take the the um, the, um, the row mm -hmm. and just send it. If if, but it will happen when you commit the transaction. Yeah. So it means that it's valid data. It doesn't matter if it's you know if it's if, if there is no foreign key or whatever. Yeah, it's it's per row. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Is it me or someone else is already asking? I, uh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation, especially the outboard pa outbox backend. It's really thank informative. Uh, uh, going back to the explanation that you give, like the from legacy system to the microservice pat le yeah. Uh, data. Yeah, the uh, strangler uh, pattern. Yeah. yeah. So for that, for example, I have uh, two tables. One is the similar question. Like uh, I have two tables. One is order and order details. And when I need to insert some data to the uh, microservice, I need data from both tables to be aggregated. So is there any recommendation or recommended way to aggregate the results from these two tables and make it as an uh, 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 insert to the new tables? You said that you've got the order, the order and you have two tables. Yeah. <laughs> and then, it's, it's so basically, it like uh, for the MongoDB, so yeah, uh, that it's like an aggregate domain object, so it contains both uh, order and order details together. So it's like a one-to-many relation. So, yeah. but in the legacy, so you want to put both of yeah, the. Yeah. No, uh, you you can you can. Yeah, but the, the practice. Yeah, you can. It work. Yeah, it could work. And you want to move both of the tables, right, to the to the MongoDB. Yeah, it, th there's no problem in do it. That thing, just uh, because um, when you configure a division, you configure uh, first you configure division of where is the Kafka, and then you can dynamically set I want to do this table, this table, this table, this table. Then what you could do is like take the both of the tables and then you know create both of the. I mean that uh, um, both of the tables into an outbox. If you want, you can just create an outbox table as well, where you aggregate data, mm -hmm. and then you've got Divisium listening this aggregation and send it to the uh, MongoDB. Okay. So th this could work because at the very end, um, this outbox table helps you to put there what you want. It's n so you, it, it's let's say that you you are able to just not add 
the order and then the order line, but you can say, okay, I'm going to take an order, and then I, I'm going to take the, all the order lines of this order, put it into a JSON, and send it to the outbox pattern. This is what I've done in this case. If, if, you, uh, if, if you check here, in, the, in uh, here, if you see here, this is a outbox, this is the outbox um, table, and I've got in the same table orders and customers, and you see that I'm putting here the JSON files that are totally different of what I insert in the original table, because uh, when I'm uh, inserting them uh, using, uh, wait, um, thank you. Here, um, uh, um, here, what I'm doing here with this off that it's not uh, visible is just taking all the information. So you see, this is an order. This is the order. This is the order. So now I'm saying, okay, I want to create an order created even of this order. So I'm just taking what I want, not all the order, just what I want, and I save it as an op box. So okay. this off is just taking this um, order created even and transforms to the op box entity. And in this case, I'm doing the, the same. I'm just creating the envoys from the order and just pick it up other things. And then I just create it as a JSON. This off just creates as a JSON file these invoices and then it stores. So you can put whatever you want in these tables and then it's automatically populated to the Kafka topic. Thanks, good answers. As I said before, he, uh, here you've got the example. So you, if you want to inspect the, the code, you will, but it's, it's super easy. I mean, it might seem complicated, but it's super easy to work thanks of Divisium because one only have, um, uh, databases, the other one just have Kafka, and then magically things are connected. Yeah. Thanks, that answers. Thanks. Okay, thank you.